Good morning. The Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication holds this public hearing. The date is Thursday, May 17th, and the, nine, the time is approximately 9.18. This public hearing is conducted by the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication, and it will now come to order. Notice of the public hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets via electronic format on Thursday, May 10th, 2018, with a second notice provided on Tuesday, May 15th, 2018. Notice of the hearing was also made on the Guam Legislature's website. The chairman of the committee requested that I start this uh, public hearing, and he is, on, he is on route to the hearing, so in his absence, uh, we will proceed. The first bill on the agenda is bill number 224-34 COR, which was introduced by myself, Mary C. Torres. Bill 224-34 is an act to add chapter 9A to title 17, WAM code annotated, relative to codifying student health services requirements applicable to Guam Department of Education schools, authorizing delegation of student health services to school employees other than healthcare practitioners under specific circumstances and limiting liability of personnel providing student health services and administering emergency medication to be known as the Student Health Services Act. In the interest of time uh, and because the bill is provided on the website for anybody that wishes to to, per to peruse the bill, um, I will proceed to go into the public testimony. And we have several people who have signed up to testify for Bill 224-34. So I'd like to call up, please, Mr. Mark Mendiola, Ms. Marlene Carbolito, Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero, Ms. Carla Haddock, and Mr. Dan Del Priori. And if I may ask Mr. Mark Mendiola, you may begin. Uh, please state your name okay. and you may begin your testimony. Good and good morning, honorable senators. My name is Mark Mendiola. I'm the chairperson of the Guam Education Board, uh, also a parent of the Department of Education. So, situs masi para the tempo, honorable senators. Um, I know uh, we're here to render testimony on the bill and I just wanna say that um, uh, thank Senator Torres for the opportunity to come in uh, a couple months ago. Um, you know, we, we had an opportunity to sit down together and talk about this idea of uh, uh, providing uh, legislation that would help our students. Um, I just want to share a little story about my uh, experiences as a parent. Uh, I used to work in another school district um, and at one point in time there was a, a, an emergency situation that came up. One of the students that was actually doing physical activity um, had an asthma attack. And um, it was one of the most, uh, to this very day, it's a haunting experience for me because this student um, was not able to get the emergency medical treatment that he needed and um, he expired, he passed away. He didn't have the um, emergency meds, uh, they weren't able to administer it to him right away. And um, to this very day, this haunts me as, as a parent because I have a child that has asthma. And <clears throat> uh, I work through the department to ensure that there is a plan for my son in the event that uh, he does have an asthma attack. I make sure he has all his medication. And what this bill really does, it allows parents uh, some sort of comfort level that uh, you know, if a nurse is attending to other emergency needs and if there's an emergency that arises with another child, that our staff, our teachers, uh, those who are close by would be able to assist in that em emergency situation. And so, you know, after reading this bill, and I, I know that good senators work with the Department of Education, uh, our, our uh, head nurse, that runs the program within all the schools. We have 31,000 kids, 41 schools. And um, you know, 
when you're out there, you just don't know what emergency could arise, you know, that can come up. Uh, our kids do physical activity out of the hot sun. Um, there's a lot of bees, wasps, things that can possibly put their lives in a moment's notice in danger. And you only have a specific amount of time or short amount of time to respond to that emergency. And so, um, you know, I'm here in support of this bill as a parent because I know that if this was an, op uh, if a parent came to the school with a child that had uh, allergies or certain things, medical conditions, that they would be able to exercise this through this law. And it will give them an, uh, that sense of comfort that while their child is away from their care, that whoever's entrusted in their care would at least have some sort of um, training, if you will, in administering these emergency medication. So uh, with that, uh, I, as a parent, I stand uh, before you guys uh, in support of this. And my other hand, as the board chairperson, I know that uh, this uh, legislation has been vetted through our internal uh, you know, um, group of experts, and they have uh, provided input to this bill. I think this bill uh, really looks out for the best interests of our kids. So I'm hoping that this bill does get your favorable support and that uh, if there are any policy changes that needs to occur because of this bill or if there's any uh, new addition to uh, the current policies that exist, we will definitely take that under consideration and move it forward. So Undunkle and Mrs. Dusmasi, thank you, Senator Torres, for uh, taking the charge and, and, uh, and helping our kids uh, have a good chance of um, getting the help they need in the event of an emergency. Mrs. Masi. Thank you, Mr. Mendiola. I also want to note that one of the, um, the statistics that we were working on when we spoke with the Department of Education is that we're looking at the number of children that have certain ailments that require medication, either for maintenance or, or in emergencies to, self, to save their lives. And the statistics that were presented to us were 1,700 students who have asthma, more than 1,200 students that have severe allergies, more than 200 students that have seizure disorders, and more than 50 students who have diabetes. So that, that was also brought up uh, to our attention when yeah. we were drafting the bill. And, I, I, and, and that's a, a very, I mean, the statistics show it's, it's very important to have this type of mechanism in place because you have one nurse in the school system and, um, you know, there, there, there could be situations that can come up that uh, there they're just needs, uh, you know, additional emergency support in the event that something does come up. But that's a, that's a high number and we have to be prepared. And this is one way of us being prepared. And I think in the bill that uh, I, as a parent, is that uh, I have the opportunity to say, yes, I allow my teacher or this one-to-one uh, -one aide who's... Uh, to administer these medications in the event an emergency does come up. And I, and I think it also allows for that training to occur within the department so that that person can get at least the emergency training that's necessary. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mignola, I know you have to leave, so I wanted to afford my colleagues, uh, Senator Jim Espaldon and Vice Speaker Terlahi, if they have any questions before you, questions of you if before you leave. Vice Speaker, do you have any questions? Yes, so could you please clarify, um, all the schools currently have nurses, correct? We have our uh, nursing um, staff here, yes, I believe so. That's, uh, we have uh, so nurse school policy. Yes, ma'am. We're yes, going to have nurses in every school. Yes. And currently, isn't, doesn't the law provide that the nurses or the school health counselor could... Um, Administer med medication? Yes, yes. or allow the administ administering of medicine by uh, someone else in the school who they de designate? I, to my knowledge, ma'am, I, I, all I know is that this law that uh, is going to allow for us as a parent that uh, to engage in our child's... Yeah, but uh, are you here as a board member? No, that, I'm asking you the board's policy. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you. I came here on two reasons. That's why I made it very clear that I'm here to testify also as a parent and then also for the board. You're asking me on the board issue. I'm, I'm saying this, that uh, I believe there's testimony that's going to be rendered that highlights all the policies within the 
within the board, within the Department of Education. Uh, I, I, I You've believe, submitted that? Yeah, th that's gonna, testimony that will be submitted that will highlight everything that the department has in place, absolutely. All right, so what is, what is the difference between this and the existing board policy? May I ask uh, our nurse, head nurse to, uh, from the Department of Education to offer that response? Yes, sure. And please identify yourself for the record. Should I press the button? Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Julieta Kaneni. I'm the Community Health and Nursing Services Administrator for the Department of Education. Closer. A little bit closer. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, my name is Julieta Kaneni. I'm the Community Health and Nursing Services Administrator for the Department of Education. You were just asking um, about, Chair, what is the difference between this proposed bill and our current policy? Currently under Guam laws, non-nurses are not allowed to administer medication. Only school nurses are allowed. Only registered nurses and licensed practical nurses are currently, under the current law, allowed to administer medication. So in the school setting, I cannot teach the teacher or the principal um, how to administer that EpiPen. The law does not allow that. Medication is a specific nursing function, and under the current laws, it is not something you can delegate to a non-nurse. All right, because I'm... I'm now looking at the DOE SOP 1200-006 that says school health counselors or designated DOE personnel will only administer prescribed medications to students on campus or at school-sponsored activities. So it says SHC or designated DOE personnel, and then it goes on to say um, it requires a licensed healthcare provider to a prescription, yes. right? And then it says uh, an authorization to administer the prescription signed and dated annually by both the student's licensed health care provider and the parent. Yes. Um, we, we have an amendment to that. Um, when we met in 2015, 16 with the Guam Board of Nurse Examiners. An amendment? What? We have an amendment to that SOP. Sorry, uh, okay. I might not have it with me. When we met with the Guam Board of Nurse Examiners and they clearly stated to us that non-nurses are not allowed to administer medication, we immediately changed our medication consent form that clearly indicate only the school health counselors and licensed practical nurses can administer at this time medication. Okay, so it's currently policy. Is, is that a written policy? I, I yes. Think, All right. I think this one, uh, good Senator, uh, Vice So this Speaker. would allow non-nurses. So this proposed bill will to change the current will policy change that, that, right. that we would be able to train um, non-nurses to help in emergency situations. Mm -hmm. For emergency situations. Yeah. Right. right. But that, that, then that emergency is going to be determined by a non-nurse. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That we well, would be very specific um, yes. as the bill proposed. We're talking about... Yeah. I, um, there was... Um, sorry. In the bill, it referred to what is diabetes, was it asthma, and severe allergies. All right, and so, uh, Mr. Mendiola, part of this bill says that DOE shall establish a position to assist in carrying out these responsibilities, uh, or it may be designated using existing personnel resources or by contract with an individual who holds a bachelor's degree in nursing or is a registered nurse. So is this going to be another position to, like, on top of the already uh, existing nurses in the no, schools? I think what it does is just provides the flexibility for us to explore these things. I think once a law is passed, if this, this receives favorable consideration, the law is passed. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I believe this bill has been, um, that, that, that the Department of Education through the, uh, the Administrator for the Nursing has worked with a good senator to flush out any of these issues. 
And so I do know that if there is a board policy change that, that is required or that's going to be needed, that it will come from, uh, from the superintendent up to the board. Uh, so uh, to answer your question in terms of um, adding additional personnel, I just believe it's, it's broad enough that it provides for that opportunity. It, it should, should that be the direction that the department would like to go? And so uh, at this well, that, That's what I'm asking. Has okay. the department determined whether it needs to hire additional personnel in order to implement this, or are we able to just, yeah. are we going to just allow yeah. this to happen? Usually how we've been operating is we let the department make that determination, and if it comes to the board, then we'll, make, we'll consider that recommendation. But uh, she can respond. Uh, I, I don't believe that there is one that they're, they're Vice looking Speaker, at. Vice that, Speaker, that, that was one of the, the discussion points before the bill was even introduced in speaking with the superintendent. And it was, it was deemed that by all parties that, that this bill provides for the department to identify current resources. So someone who's already in a position like Ms. Ms. Kaneni uh, could serve in that capacity. It, it doesn't call for an additional person because there are people in place who already oversee these types of things. So the bill, the bill specifically is to create um, standardized protocols for the guidelines for this type of Student Health Services Act and, um, and then other things following. It enables the delegation of services to, to a consenting employee who's properly trained. And then there are protocols for what that training is. Uh, and so there's, there, there's a lot of particulars about this bill, but in terms of the mechanism to implement it, that already exists within the Department of Education as the uh, superintendent also determined. So it, it wouldn't add another burden uh, in terms of personnel. Okay, so, and so the bill then says a school employee pretty much can be de delegated responsibility to perform the health service by a physician. So I, I guess if you are currently in charge of these things at the schools and you are testifying in favor of this bill, then you have no objection to a physician designating someone in the school. Um, they no longer have to be designated by the school health counselors and they no longer, or the schools. I mean, you know, the, pretty much the physician can, desi can delegate, it looks like, to any employee in a school after they train them. That's not how I interpret it. I interpret it as the physician can, also the advanced practice registered nurse and the registered nurse can delegate. So normally if we have, for instance, a student with severe allergies, um, we will create a health plan individualized health plan, and doc will order on there to sign some symptoms when, this epi, when the EpiPen is supposed to be administered. So that is the order from the provider. We can only administer medication in the school setting based upon an order from a provider. So yes, the doc is crucial in our administering of medication in the school setting. Right, but what I'm saying is the difference now is that instead of a doctor giving you a plan, or you know, the plan involves you, the school health counselors, it's now between the doctor and delegating a school employee, not necessarily a, a health counselor or a nurse, is that correct? Yeah, most probably those are part I mean, in the proposed bill that we could reword because all healthcare activities um, will be managed through the nursing office not directly with employees that's non-health care trained. It has to be the nurse first. And we make that assessment with our team, which is the doctor and the parent, if it is suitable to train the next person. But isn't that the current situation? No, currently the law does not allow us to teach non-nurses to administer emergency That's medication. That's what I mean. Currently, we, they have to go through the nurse. But yes. this would allow them to go through a non-nurse trained by a physician. To, and that non-nurse, non-medical personnel would be able to... Does it, it also further uh, stipulate in the law that it is the doctor, it is the advanced practice registered nurse, and it is the registered nurse, which we are, that able to do that delegation to our school employees, not only the doctor. It's we as a team. 
Okay, well, I'm going to look at it again. I just want to clarify also. But I think, too, we have to, if, if we're looking at Section 9A202, what that contemplates is that the school has these different tiers of health care provision. So it, it's A, A would be a physician or a registered nurse or a health technician or an employee who's, who's delegated responsibility to perform. So it's, it's, not, it's not contemplated that in reading that physician that the physician is someone outside of the scope of the school services. So, I mean, this is almost contemplating that the school has a physician in its, in its employment. That's what this means in the statute. So that in terms of who can, who can train and delegate, it's, it's one of these types of people. It's contemplating that school has this tier of these different types of, of facilities. In the present case, this, most of the schools, as I understand from uh, speaking with DOE, is that they at least have a registered nurse on staff. Yes, that's right. That's what I clarified also, that there's a registered nurse already on staff, but this would depart from that, where currently everybody has to go through a registered nurse or, you know, make a plan with that registered nurse. This also contemplates a plan, but it also allows for a delegation of another non-nurse personnel on the school to an employee, it says, right. and it doesn't really define whether, which types of employees, except that they be trained by a physician. Yeah. And <clears throat> that's Madam Vice Speaker, may I, my, just my personal experience, my, my child has asthma. So, I know. I, uh, have, I want to explain to you. So No, how, I am asking the board's policy. That's what I want to know. What's the difference between this and the policy? Because I'm, asthma, I'm, I understand a little bit, and I understand um, allergies because I have those myself. So yeah, please allow, I understand allow the me need. I'm just asking the policy. I want to determine what's the difference between well, this and your existing policy. Well, I think the, the key word is emergency. And uh, I had to go to the school as a parent, fill out all the forms that the department has required me to fill out so that my child can get the um, abiteral treatment that he needs if he has an asthma attack, all right? So um, there are school aides out there in the, in the playground, and there's a couple of times where I received a call and saying, hey, your son is, uh, has heavy breathing. Can we administer the meds? So I had to go to my doctor, get the, the treatment plan, provide it to the school so that the nurse can administer it. And so this, I think, just provides that mechanism in place. I have another child with disabilities, and he has, he's been with a one-to-one -one aid, and he goes from, from place to place. In the event that the nurse's office is too far away and he has a, a, an allergic reaction to something, I wanted to know as a parent that there's going to be someone there that would be able, that is trained, that is able to administer these emergency medication. And I'm just saying that this law provides that opportunity in the emergency situation. This is not like something that's going to be uh, um, uh, just a, a regular SOP for every, uh, this is on a case-by-case -case basis, but it just provides the opportunity for, this, for the Department of Education in the, in the event of an emergency, and if a parent wants to exercise it, then this is the, this is the opportunity for us to do it. And so, yes, uh, I believe that we have uh, internal mechanisms right now within the school system. Uh, there's, there are nurses on staff, but like I mentioned earlier, there's 31,000 kids. Some of our school, our school populations are over 1,000. And this just provides an opportunity, and if the staff is willing to get trained to administer these types of emergency, during these emergency situations, it'll provide them that opportunity. So, um, and if you find any gaps in our policies or anything in law, then this is an opportune time for us to, to really consider. And I'm taking the notes down that uh, the quest questions you're raising, but I believe that the department has, uh, this is just looking at it as one way to help our, our parents and our students feel a little bit more safe. I understand that, and I, and that's what. So you agree that this allows the non-nurse personnel employees on the campus to administer the medicines. It actually also allows self student self, self administration of med medicine. And I was simply asking, what is the difference between that and I thought current policy already allows that, but I'm tell I'm being told now that your current policy does not allow that at all that that's been changed to not allow no, the current non nurse policy, personnel see, to okay currently only rns and licensed practical nurses are allowed to administer medication in the department of education non nurses 
which could be school principals or any of the DOE other employees than nurses, they are not allowed by law. The proposed bill um, before us would allow us to train. Um, we created a criteria where we said, for instance, they have to be CPR trained, they have to complete the training course, the medication administration training course. We provided some guidelines on who would we train if this bill would proceed and be approved. All right, I guess I just need to see then the change in the policy because the policies I'm looking at, uh, they, yes. the, the, they don't reflect that. They reflect that the school is already able to designate this to other employees and Sorry. especially, and they, have a, and they have a very special protocol for asthma in particular, Yes, right? we do. All right, and, and um, all right, so are you saying, Mr. Mendiola, then that part B on page six that the establishing a new position is not necessary because we already have nurses in every school? Part B, training designated on menu, uh, page six. Uh, part B. This is a, a position to manage the administering of medicine by non-medical personnel. Yes. We're gonna hire another medical personnel to, uh, to do that, it looks like, or we are giving that possibility. That's, so that's why I'm asking, if this is going to go through the school health counselors, mm -hmm. then uh, yeah, they should I, be I, the manager. I, I see your point, mm -hmm. and, I, and the position may be established or designated using existing personnel resources. Mm -hmm. So um, if there, we already have existing um, uh, personnel resources, then I don't see there, we have to establish another position. All right, all right, thank, thank you. you. Let's go back up to Mr. Del Priori. Sure. Did you, did you hear what you thank you, Mr. Mendiola. You're recognized, please. Uh, Dan Del Priori on behalf of the Guam Federation of Teachers. The GFT supports the proposed bill with a couple of constructive suggestions, if we may. On the bottom of page five, where it talks about standardized protocols and guidelines to be established, um, it might be beneficial to put a timeline by which they will be established, sometimes the desire to see something created calling for guidelines, protocols, ends up drifting off into not being performed. So if you put a shall be created by whatever you think reasonable. On page six, the bottom um, subsection B indicates DOE may establish or designate a position if they do so, what about funding for such a position? Where are they going to um, get the funds to hire this new position? In regard to Page 15, the last part, the top, number two, um, may provide training. A licensed healthcare practitioner may provide training. Would it be better to make that shall or must a mandatory term if that's thought to be desired? Um, page 15, ma'am. The term now may is permissive, so if it's thought desirable, you might make it a requirement. Um, down under 9A4012B, each school is encouraged to keep an ephedrine auto injector. The word encouraged, um, from my experience in GFTs, it won't be done 
if you think this is an important item for the school to have, make it mandatory and provide funding for it. Otherwise, it might be obtained by one principal, ignored by, by the next. And then it talks about are donated to the school or a school has sufficient funding. Again, if the legislature thinks it important to have it, then please do so. And then similarly on the top of page 16, each school electing, if you let the school decide to do it or not, by and large, they probably won't do it. If you think it's important, make it a requirement and, and give DOE the funds to obtain it for each school. Those are the constructive, we believe, comments from GFT. Otherwise, we believe the bill desirable um, and should be implemented. Thank you, thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr. Del Perry. Um, yes, sir. We'll move on to Ms. Haddock. Half a day, Senators. Uh, I am Carla Haddock. I'm a registered nurse, have my master's of science in nursing, and I'm here to speak as a nurse today and also as a parent. Um, some of the concerns that, that were brought up about this bill um, with Mr. Mendiola was that I believe the current policy doesn't allow for the delegation to a non-licensed personnel. And this current law, the, this law will allow for that delegation only in specific situations. Uh, and it's completely voluntary. The parents have to agree to it. So it's not like we're going to be mandating to each parent that if there is no nurse available, and this is only if there's no licensed professional there, that a non-licensed person can administer the medication. It's very individualized. Um, also, I think with the epinephrine that Mr. Del Priori brought up, the epinephrine is a very expensive drug. And it's not necessary in every school if they don't, there's like not students that have severe allergies or anaphylactic allergies, then you don't necessarily need to stock epinephrine. Um, it's not something that's standardly stocked really anywhere except for the hospitals. I mean, unless students who have anaphylactics will carry it with them usually. What I really, really like about this bill is the self-administration. Many students are trained, their parents are trained. I mean, it's not unusual for non-licensed people to be trained already to give these medications. Uh, current policy doesn't allow the student to even check their blood glucose. It has to have a nurse. So if the nurse is absent or out on training, I mean, we don't expect our nurses to have perfect attendance all the time, do we? It allows the student to be able to you know, oh, I feel a little weak. Let me check my blood sugar. Let me go ahead and administer my glucagon or my insulin. So I think that that's really what's needed. The only thing that I might add to this bill is um, Guam does have, and I don't know if DOE provided a large population of hemophiliacs, which is a genetic disorder that you don't have a coagulation factor where you bleed. So if they're out on the playground and they fall, they're going to need to administer themselves their specific factor. And a lot of students are trained to do that, um, and they know how to administer it. So I think if we can add those hemophiliacs to it, that would be great. I spoke last night with um, several advanced practice nurses about this bill. And the only concern was liability, which is addressed perfectly in the bill, models of federal law. And the other issue was the comfort of having a stranger administering it to your child. But, like I said, that's completely voluntary. If you do not want to sign the consent to allow this to happen, then that's fine. I personally, as a parent, would love it. That peace of mind, because if my child does have a medical condition, minutes can make the difference. I mean, the minute from calling the nurse and having the nurse run across a large campus can make every difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haddock. Mr. Leon Grail. Thank you very much. My name is Ken Leon Guerrero. I'm the spokesperson for Guam Citizens for Public Accountability. And I'm also the past chairman of the Policy and Advocacy Committee of the Non-Communicable Disease Consortium. 
and I wanted to testify on this bill in those capacities and also as a parent of a child that had, parent of a former child <laughs> who uh, had a very strict medical regime. I, in, I experienced an incident many years ago when my child was in school and taking medication to prevent migraines and seizures. The nurse was called away to a, con a training conference and when he went to the office to take his medication, he was not allowed to take any medication. I had to drive 60 miles from a business meeting to the school so that as the parent I could administer the medicine needed to prevent seizures and migraines. That is a very common situation and as the former chair of PANDA, I can tell you we are seeing dramatic increases in chronic diseases going down into our high school, elementary, middle schools and elementary schools. We have children in elementary school who are taking insulin and high blood pressure medications. We have our, we've had our first heart attacks in high school already. When it comes to dealing with the health of children, seconds count, especially dealing with chronic medical situations. And it is not always convenient or possible, especially in an education system that is short-staffed. And I say short-staffed because when I went to school, each school had a nurse and a licensed practical nurse as well. So there were two people. Here, the schools are lucky if they have one and very often they don't have one because life happens, people get sick, or Department of Education has a training conference that pulls all the nurses out of a school for some reason. And therefore we have situations that occur on a regular basis where access to life-saving medications is interrupted. Uh, as a parent, I would have willingly signed a document and created an individual health plan for my child in accordance with the way it's outlined in this program so that a designated person, either a teacher or someone who would, you know, an, another person on the staff would have had the ability in the event that the nurse was not there, they couldn't reach me, to give my child that type of medication. So I commend Senator Torres for pushing this bill forward because it is very important that as we see the chronic disease rates escalating down into the younger and younger children, we're going to have more situations where access to life-saving medications in a very, very timely fashion is going to be the difference between life or death. And I think this bill fills that gap nicely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Leon Guerrero. Marlene Carbolito. Good morning, everyone. My name's Marlene Carbolito. I'm a registered nurse with a Master's of Science in Nursing degree. I serve as the Acting Administrator for the Health Professional Licensing Office and the Acting Administrator for the EMS Office. And I just want you to know I'm not a lawyer. Um, this is an AG, Rob Weinberg, who serves as legal counsel for the EMS Commission, HPLO, always war warns me, Marlene, don't go there, don't interpret the law. So um, thank you for those who are lawyers by profession, our senators. <laughs> so um, together with a staff of seven individuals, we have the overwhelming responsibility of issuing licenses to properly credentialed healthcare professionals on Guam. Um, the boards include the medical, nursing, pharmacy, dental, allied health, social worker, optometry, barbering and cosmetology, and the EMS commission. And I gave you an attachment of how many licensed professionals we administer to on Guam. For the nursing board, we have 50 APRNs, which are the advanced practice registered nurses. We have 1,064 registered nurses practicing on Guam. We have 142 licensed professional nurses, 305 um, certified nurse assistants. We proctored over 339 uh, exams since 2016. And since 2016, we've received and uh, reviewed 27 complaints to the board, and we've disciplined one nurse. So the board members, um, I serve as the interim executive officer and I directly administer to the following board members. Dr. Kevin Hitosis, 
Dr. Kathy Wood, Christine Tucaro from GMH, Lynn Okada from Public Health, Bernadette Santos from VA Clinic, Brenda Presto, who's the LPN, and Charlotte Huntsman, who's the public member. So on April 13, uh, 2017, Juliet, Ms. Julieta Kineni, the um, Community Health Nurse Services Administrator, uh, came over from DOE. Um, she appeared before the Board of Nurse Examiners at the regularly uh, scheduled board meeting with a letter signed by Superintendent John Fernandez, Hernan Fernandez, requesting review and approval of GDOE's Medication Administration Training Guidelines for Unlicensed Assistive Personnel, and I've given you an attachment of that. I submitted it with the um, testimony. He requested for public health via Guam Board of Nurse Examiners to review and approve the training handbook. So at the next meeting, uh, May 11th board meeting, the chairperson, Dr. Kevin Hitosis, was concerned that a registered nurse was delegating this task to a non-licensed individual. GBNE did not have the authority, authority to regulate the unlicensed individual. The board reviewed the GDOE Medication Administration guidelines for training unlicensed assistive personnel and determined that it was not their authority to approve the request. So GBNE, um, as you know, they regulate the practices of APRNs, RNs, LPNs, and certified nurse assistants. So they do not regulate unlicensed assistive personnel. So I offer the following testimony on Bill 224, which authorizes physicians, APRNs, and RNs to delegate health services to a, in a school setting to health service technicians and school employees. <coughs> These unlicensed individuals will be practicing under the delegation of healthcare services by the physician, the APRN, the RN. Thus, the question comes up as to who will be regulating the practice of these individuals who are unlicensed. Is, so my, our question is, is the physician, the APRN, the RN, or LPN going to be held liable for the actions or inactions of the health service technician or the school employee that resulted in an adverse event requiring a disciplinary action. In reference, Public Law 29-71, which is the Guam Board of Nurse Examiner's Administrative Rules and Regs on Professional Conduct Scope of Practice, the RN, including the APRN, shall delegate professional responsibilities only to individuals who the registrant knows or believes to be qualified by education, experience, or licensure to perform and supervise those persons to whom nursing services have been delegated. She should be accountable for the quality of nursing care delegated to others, and so on. So each nurse is accountable to clients, the nursing profession, and the board for Complying, complying with the requirements of this act and the quality of nursing care rendered and for recognizing limits of knowledge and experience and planning for management of situations beyond the RN's expertise. So moving on, Bill 224, provisions of health service delegation states that health services shall be provided in a school setting by the physician, the APRN, the registered nurse or LPN, or a non-licensed health technician, and so on, or a school employee. It mentions in limitation of liability, a school employee who has been properly, <coughs> properly delegated responsibility for performing a health services under this section shall act as an agent of the school and be granted liability protection under the federal Paul D. Coverdell Teacher Liability Protection Act. So in reference, the limitation on liability for teachers, liability protection for teachers, I just took an, uh, uh, the, the excerpt out of it. So the question is, will teachers be designated as the school personnel trained to administer the emergency care medications? So that's um, a question we had. So in reference, there are 45 registered nurses and three licensed practical nurses practicing in the Department of Education school system 
who are already qualified and trained to provide pediatric emergency medical services. And I know this for a fact because Julieta does a great job in training the school nurses. I've listed their names down for you to review. Two are actually advanced practice registered nurses already. Um, they train all the time with the EMS providers, with Guam Fire Department and the ED staff, physicians and nurses. So as the acting EMS office administrator, I advocate for pediatric emergency medical services for all children, no matter where they live, play, or go to school. The intent of Bill 224 is to be applauded. However, the provision of out-of-hospital emergency medical services is actually under the Guam Fire Department, with over 200 EMTs licensed by the EMS office, who are certified in national standards of practice, and they recertify every two years under National Registry of EMTs which has strict requirements for 72 hours of continuing education in emergency medical services, education and training. The Guam EMS system is composed of various partners, ED physicians, GFD EMTs, advanced EMTs, military EMS partners, and private ambulance companies, and an EMS commission that oversees the EMS office and promulgates rules and regulations for EMS services on Guam, by which I have to mention Ms. Julieta is also a member of that. Pre-hospital providers should be experienced and trained properly in pediatric emergency medical care. The provision of pediatric emergency medical care has to be under the medical direction of a physician at the ED or a pediatrician who is readily available by telephone or radio. Assessment of pre-existing or sudden life-threatening conditions, diabetes, asthma, seizure, anaphylaxis, they all require in-depth training of emergency responders Properly assessing the child, whether it's sudden onset, chronic, pre-existing condition, even taking a blood pressure to determine hypovolemic shock, distributive shock, hypoglycemia, cardiogenic shock, cardiac and respiratory emergencies. They look at the capillary refill time, the pulse rate, is it widening, narrow? Recognizing various heart sounds, respiratory rate, breath sounds depth, nasal flaring, sternal retractions, equal and bilateral chest movement. This is just assessment. All of these have indications for emergency medical responders to react. Administration of emergency medic medications. EpiPen is taught in BLS classes, and many patients are discharged home with this, with this easy-to-use device. Insulin pens are also given to parents upon discharge from the hospital for home use with specific instructions on how to use it. They look at the child's diet, the exercise, blood sugar, presenting illnesses. Insulin administration, on the other hand, in an uncontrolled environment can be deadly for the child if given too much. Two nurses actually have to verify the amount given to a patient in the hospital setting. Seizure medications are controlled medications and are kept most of them are kept under lock and key. Some of the medications given are um, like Valium, okay? Uh, overdosing on such medications can be deadly. Training checklists, and I looked at the ones that we reviewed, the board had reviewed, and the main component that we weren't satisfied with was the assessment part, and all this that I mentioned is part of the assessment. Um, so training checklists may not be as sufficient as some are lacking key indicators. So it is important that school personnel recognize when EMS needs to be activated and to call 911 immediately. So I'm going to take off my professional hat and I'm going to talk as a mother. So my daughter Christiana is a child with special health care needs who attended Gany Heights Elementary School. And I felt at ease knowing that the registered nurse, Ms. Eden, was there to take care of her medical needs. Anna, she used to have a tracheostomy, and she had asthma-like symptoms for most of her childhood. She would require breathing treatments, and Ms. Eden had the experience of working with very sick children as a pediatric care nurse at the hospital. So I was comfortable with her. However, I would not be comfortable for a school employee to know how to assess my child. And most children in schools now, we're trying to get them uh, integrated, and they have really serious chronic medical conditions. So I would be very uncomfortable for a school employee to know how to assess my child. 
to listen to her lungs with a stethoscope and determine if it were an upper respiratory condition, to indicate the use of albuterol for nebulizer treatment, or to immediately call 911 for emergency transfer to the nearest hospital. As a parent, I would be outraged if the nurse were to delegate such important duties to school personnel who are not able to assess my child first prior to her being given potentially life-threatening medications such as insulin, seizure meds, epi, glucagon. But you know, in Guam, we're very small and it, we're very fortunate that there is a school nurse in every school with the exception of one school. And I believe that is J.P. Torres Success Academy in Santa Rita. Furthermore, I'm available to meet with the senator, with DOE, to discuss measures to ensure that prompt emergency medical services and, and attention is available to children in the school system. At the administrative level, it's important for EMS providers to network together, to review existing plans, to develop emergency standing orders, to redefine the existing EMS protocols. Delegating the provision of pediatric emergency care to non-EMS providers is risking the lives of these children who are already at, list, at risk for lifetime injury and possibly death. So thank you for allowing me to testify on this. Thank Questions? you very much, Ms. Carpolito. Did you wish to? Please. Sorry, my name is Julieta Kaneni. I'm the Community Health and Nursing Service Administrator for the Department of Education. Within the Guam Department of Education, we currently have one Community Health and Nursing Services Administration with 41 registered nurses working as school health counselors and three licensed practical nurses taking care of the health care needs of over 30,000 students and approximately 4,000 employees. At the beginning of each school year, we distribute emergency health and information form to all students that we use to track any health information provided by the parents and guardians. Based upon information received, we call parents and guardians to follow up on whether students are still on any, on any medication and or treatment plans. See summary of 2017-18 chronic disease listing. I just updated it yesterday with the latest updates again, the one that Senator Torres had was um, previous numbers, this is the latest number as of last night that I work. We also have various board policies and standard operating procedures in place that provide guidelines for our school health counselors and LPNs for managing various chronic conditions and or health concerns. For example, we have board policy 336, health policy 337, health requirements for registration, 366 pregnancy, board policy 421 medication administration. Um, we have standard operating procedures that deals with communicable disease, controlled substances, SOP 120006 medication administration, illness, injury, pregnancy, diabetes management at school and school sponsored activities, um, 13 managing allergy, allergies and anaphylaxis particulosis, health requirements for school attendance, seizure management, hemophilia, and asthma management. Again, since 2014-15, only school health counselors and licensed practical nurses have been allowed to administer prescribed medications in GDOE school setting based upon our discussion with the Guam Board of Nurse Examiners. In previous years, school administrators were allowed to administer prescribed medication per GDO, per GDO e board policy 421, but we immediately discontinued that practice following the GBNE meeting. In September, on September 23, 2015, I emailed G Guam Board of Nurse examiners requesting a disposition from the board to allow school health counselors to train non-nurses to administer emergency medications like EpiPen, asthma inhaler, glucagon, and diastat. We met with Guam Board of Nurse and examiners and were instructed to create a medication administration training manual for non-nurses with competency skills checklists and guidelines on how to identify volunteers to respond to the medical emergencies at their respective schools. Our school health 
the community health and nursing service um, administrator created a school health counselor medication administration subgroup that was tasked to review the latest evidence pra practice guidelines in school health and medication management. The group also worked with various school districts and developed the medication administration guidelines for non-nurses. Um, the National Association of School Nurses referred to them as unlicensed assistive personnel. We also included guidelines for the selection of non-nurses to administer medication, be CPR first aid certified, employees agree to the responsibility, be familiar with the student in the school setting, and successfully completion of the medication administration training for non-nurses. When we were ready, of course, to present the manual back to the Guam Board of Nurse Examiners, they then decided they do not have jurisdiction and they cannot rule in favor or not in favor of non-nurses being able to administer medication. Medication in the school setting can only be administered if it was prescribed by a licensed healthcare provider that is licensed to practice on Guam and the medication consent form was signed by a parent or guardian. Normally our medication consent form is good for one school year and if there are any medication order changes, this, sorry, and if, the medication consent form is good for one here, and if there's any changes, of course, it gets to be updated sooner than that. Um, this proposed bill, 224, formalized this in statute our daily medication administration practice as outlined in our board policies and SOP. School health counselors also understand their role as teachers and mentors in line with the intent of Bill 224-34 in ensuring non-nurses are trained in their role um, as non-nurses supporting administering emergency medication. Bill 224-34 will help us to address the health needs of our students while they are in our care during, during a school day. Again, we appreciate the collaborative effort made by Senator Torres in developing this legislation before you, and we are thankful for the opportunity to express our support for Bill 224 and to explain to the committee our existing board policies and SOPs regarding medication administration in the school setting. Thank you for your continued support and partnership in this important endeavor. Thank you very much. Ken, can I ask you to excuse yourself, and I'm going to ask Ms. Young and her daughter to come up. Hi, I'm Evie Young. I'm an elementary school student who will be directly affected by this bill. I want this bill to be passed because it will... It will make me feel safer at school and my parents and nurse won't be as worried when they're away from me. My teachers also want to help me, but they can't with this bill not passed. Again, I'm Evie Young and I support this bill. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry you had to miss school this morning, but I, you're with mother, and so it's okay. If you, oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, half a day, Senators. Uh, before I go into my testimony, I'd like to, uh, listening to um, fellow mother, Ms. Marlene, I wanted to um, share some thoughts I had on that with in the bill and her concerns. I, in, the, in the bill, as my understanding is, it's delegation to very specific individuals and then they would be themselves properly trained extensively and again, it's all consenting. So as a parent, you can say no and so can the nurse and so can any person who deems that person unfit. So it's not just anyone, any personnel. So I'd like to continue with my testimony in, in saying that uh, I am in favor 
as a parent advocate of Bill 224-34, the Student Health Services Act. Four years ago, just around this time, our daughter was supposed to be getting ready for her kindergarten promotion at her school. Instead, she was in the pediatric ICU in GMH under a coma fighting for her life. And fight she did. She woke up in time to join her peers for her promotional and receive her awards. But she also woke up to a whole new life with a diagnosis of a chronic, incurable, life-threatening disease. Many things have had to change in our family's dynamic in order to accommodate this new normal. And over the course of four years, we have had many learning curves to help us get a better sense of what works and what doesn't work in our situation. Some of the biggest changes have been in our working dynamic and a greater involvement in the school. That first school year after our daughter's diagnosis, I met with a school nurse, principal, and teacher, and we came up with a plan to be able to meet the needs of a student with special medical concerns without compromising her studies or her sense of self at school. That first year, I had to take a lot of time off work to chaperone and shadow our daughter and assist school staff as we all navigated this new normal together. I would observe from the back of the classroom, cafeteria, library, and even from the back of the line with my height and backpack on looking much like a student myself. <laughs> Notebook open, jotting down patterns and scenarios and that I could ne see need adjustment. From those first days of observation, I learned quickly that logistics and time plays a big role in the comings and goings of the school. So to help streamline this process of assisting our child at school, I created a flowchart for the staff to easily and quickly reference as needed. And of course, these flowcharts are always reviewed by myself, our physician, and the nurse, and the teachers, and the principals. Everything is always regulated. Each new school year came with more clarity and insight from the lessons of the previous year, and for the most part, the school and I worked very well together to establish a new strategy for these services. Until that, till the day an emergency happened and a scenario we didn't account for occurred. I had gotten that call, that one parent, that, that call that one parent's dread. Mrs. Young, Evie is fine, but she did have an emergency. Earlier that day, her glucose levels got so dangerously low, she started to pass out in the hallway. Teachers and student aides called out to the nurse, but she was all the way across campus assisting another emergency. The staff could only keep watch as they waited for the nurse to arrive with emergency assistance. Our daughter was minutes away from falling into seizure and a potentially fatal coma. Time is of the essence in receiving these life-saving treatments. Had the nurse not been there that day because she was out on training or out assisting the other schools nearby or even out sick herself, the only option with the way the current laws are in place would have been to call 911. Waiting for an ambulance to arrive could, um, could mean a student's life. Since that episode, I have also discovered another, other scenarios that could prove potential liabilities without the support of other advanced trained staff to administer emergency treatment. And I'll say that again, advanced trained staff. Field trips. Sometimes the nurse isn't able to attend, and so with the way the current laws are in place, this puts the student in a dangerous situation so far from the only person who is legally required to assist them in an emergency situation. But to restrict a student from attending a school function because there isn't the staff there to assist her would violate the rights of that student with a medical condition. As a concerned parent, I did not want my child missing out on the, on the same opportunities as her peers just because of her unfortunate circumstance. 
So once again, I adjusted my working situation to be closer to her school in case of an emergency. And I have volunteered myself for functions outside of the school so she can attend. These situations have had their adverse effects on us physically, emotionally, and financially, and yet I am hopeful and confident in finding better solutions to these problems. And that is why I'm here today providing testimony at this hearing. I thank you, Senators, for taking the time to listen to our stories and hope that you not only consider this bill, but unanimously pass it into law. The time to act in an emergency is now, and the Student Health Services, Health Services Act is about action in an emergency. Let us give our teachers another outlet to enrich a student's life by allowing them to save it if they want to. Thank you very much. Do we ha anybody have questions? Because somebody needs to get back to school. May, may I begin, Mr. Chair? Okay. I just want to, Evie, thank you so much for being here. Your presence is the best thing that happened to me this morning. And I, I want to also acknowledge um, Amanda Young. When you first presented Evie's situation, it provided an opportunity to help so many other children that we weren't aware of. You know, a few thousands of other children just in the DOE system who have similar situations to yours, who also want equal access to all the activities that the other kids do so that you don't miss out. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So I, I want to acknowledge, Amanda, your advocacy was what brought this bill to fruition for me. And I, I want to thank you very much for opening up your story and being so personal about your challenges because that was what um, led us to explore all the avenues that could make such a legislation possible. There are issues with, with um, licensed practice of nursing, and this addresses that notwithstanding. It also addresses all the efforts that DOE and um, Mrs. Kenga have put in place with her agency, very specific guidelines and protocols. And uh, to Mrs. Carbolito, it also addressed the issue of, of what if you do not want that? What if that is not your choice? This bill also addresses that. So it, I, I believe that, and to Mr. Del Prey, also the liability, it, it addresses all the components that all of us in our different capacities and particular circumstances um, need it addressed. And, but, but mostly, I, I just want to thank the Young family because without your advocacy and without your story, Evie, and without you coming here, a lot of us wouldn't have understood the importance of taking care of you the way you deserve to be taken care of. So I am going to try my best to make this bill better so that the other 14 senators can also join me in doing this bill, which I've dedicated to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your testimony. Just wanted to clarify a couple of things. So, um, Ms. Haddock, you said that um, you, you might not feel comfortable with the delegation to a stranger, but doesn't the bill? No, um, that was a concern brought up by another advanced practice nurse, and that's why I said that, you know, it's completely voluntary, it's consent. I personally have no problems. If it's about the health of my child, and I know the emergency situations, and, and I mean, a lot of it is like, well, can't you call EMS? I mean, we can administer the medication, have that unlicensed professional administer that medication, and still call 911. But it just buys you that little bit of time you may need to get advanced care. So if we delegate, an, if the school delegates an employee, um, does that mean that, um, wouldn't we have the same issue as if with an absent nurse or a nurse that couldn't get to the student on time? I mean, how do we find the employee that's with that student 24-7? I could see how a teacher because might be not, more likely I mean, in a kindergarten or those lower level Most classes. likely it's not going to just be one person in the school. I mean, you can have two or three people or say, I'm the teacher of Evie, Evie's my student, so I'm going to go through the training. 
because I know I'm going to be with Evie. All right, well, all right. I didn't see that in this bill. I just see it being delegated to one person who is designated by the physician or, or the nurse. All right. And so, and then also I wanted to ask, so the, the list of the policy, school policies that you read off, that one of those is the one that I was reading back to you and you said is no longer valid. That's the 1200.06, which is the, the DOE's policy as to administering of medicine. Sorry, and the superintendent um, had a directive on that. Oh, yeah. So that's what I mentioned earlier. I will definitely send you a copy of that. Yes, please. Okay. And then um, um, what it's my understanding that when nurses are absent, medication is still yes. um, issued to the students. Isn't that correct? Yes. Um, as the chief nurse for DOE, they have to let me know who will be at an emergency or planned leave. And I coordinate coverage, whether it's myself or the neighboring school, because as, as of right now, only nurses are allowed to administer medication. So, for example, if Evie said Harriet Truman or Southern High or whatever school, I would ask the neighboring nurse to go and administer the medication. Are the schools not required to have a nurse in place at yes, all times? Yes, as I said, we do have a nurse per school. Sometimes emergencies come up, sometimes the nurse is sick, and they will notify me and I will ensure there is coverage. I will ensure medication coverage um, will take place. Most of the time, those, of course, are the non-emergency medication. Those are the regular medications that the student is just on. So principals no longer administer medicine? They are not allowed. Since when? Sweat. When did that policy change? When I first had that communication with the Guam Board of Nurse Examiners, I asked them before I took on this position as chief nurse for DOE, that was practice, and I asked the board, is that allowed? And they told me non-nurses are not allowed, and that's when we discontinued um, that practice. So principals are not administering that medication. Since when? when was it that was approximately 2014, 15, or l later. Because, okay, but on your website, that medical policy is still in place. So, yeah, I'd like to see we, the direction. We created an updated policy, and the superintendent, um, as I said, made an amendment. So that went out to all the principals and the school nurses, and I addressed them in the monthly principals right. meeting as well, letting them know they're not and, allowed to and administer. Currently, doesn't this, the DOE's policy allow for students to carry medicine for certain conditions such as asthma? Yes. So again, that is based upon the provider and the parent consent, and of course, meeting with them to make sure they understand if they use that medication in any other way that it's intended, that privilege will be taken away from them. All right, and I wanted to ask you one more thing. Is, what is the school's pol the Department of Education's policy on, on this prohibition on, uh, we're adding a, this bill proposes to add to the law a section that reads, parents or guardians of a student who has a condition requiring prescribed medication shall not be required or pressured to provide care for the student during regular school hours or during school-related activities. Are you currently requiring parents no. to attend s during regular school hours to provide no. care for the students? No. I am very clear with our school nurses. It is our responsibility to administer medication in the school setting. So if they absent or if they sick or any emergency, they clearly communicate with me so I can um, provide coverage so that medication get to be administered. All right. All right. That's what I wanted to clarify. What yes. is the current DOE's That's responsibility? Current what is their current um, uh, practice? Yes. And, and thank you, Ms. Young. Uh, I also uh, met you when you were um, making a presentation. I think it was at, uh, was it at the state? Stay well? No, sorry. Um, the um, Stay Well Guam Diabetes Foundation. Yes. Is that the one it's with Vanessa Williams? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. And, um, yeah, I did present there as well. You. Thank you for your advocacy and thank you for your testimony uh, uh, to your daughter. And I just wanted to ask, when, when did you talk to DOE's board about their policies? And 
Well, Did, was there any movement in? What brought it together was pretty much um, um, my discovery after um, the emergency situation, and we had a, a formal. I requested a 504 plan and sat down and we uh, worked it together and I, I, I did research and I wrote up the whole thing and I even actually created it into a kind of a blank form so it would be helpful to other students because it's not if but when the next child will be diagnosed with this mm -hmm. so it could help um, the nurses more and so all they have to do is just fill out the top half that has all the students' information and the rest of it just names student, student, so they mm -hmm. can use it as they need. But with, um, with, with that situation, that's how I presented it to DOE. I didn't really even have to go as far because the moment I requested for 504, that's when um, the school counselor uh, gathered all the team together and we sat and talked about it and that's when I discovered that there is nothing set in place for emergency situation and that's when I got scared. And, and was like, okay, well, so what about um, field trips? What about, you know, because there are situations where the nurses at the school, while well, just the class will go on a field trip. Right. So then if there isn't anyone there to provide that emergency medication, it limits her from the access to all that she can uh, uh, be a part of in the school system. So without this law set in the place, I've taken it upon myself to volunteer to be part of the school and have in a way been a lot of the school environment and the students end up seeing me as much as they probably do other staff. So I don't necessarily see that it's something I've had to do, but I get to do. Yes, I agree. Um, all right, and then um, is it your understanding that this bill would allow for the designation of one employee or more than one employee for so my understanding is it's deemed fit for our between the parent and the team of the of the school that has that, to come up with a plan. Yeah, to come up with the plan. So if the nurse and I and the and the five or four team decide that the and the and the teacher is consenting would would be the most accept, uh, acceptable route. And also say if another teacher comes up, like her gate teacher. You know, she doesn't just have one teacher. If the teacher wants to be trained too, because that was something that just came up recently, is she went to her first gate class and she had an emergency situation at, in gate and, and the nurse had to rush up a, a, like a long flight of stairs to be able to get to her and, and be there for her. So, you know, these are situations where we addressed as a team and we go, okay, um, who's gonna be the best fit to be trained to do this emergency situation? And again, it's all consenting, and we all talk about it and sign it off. All right, thank you. And, and then finally, Ms. Mr. Del Priori, just want to, um, you testified on behalf of GFT. And uh, so this bill says that a, a, an employee, not necessarily a teacher, but a, any employee on the school campus can be the one who's delegated this responsibility. Um, if if the employee consents when the employee, um, when it's not in their contract or job description as a job responsibility, uh, and they would have to get training and they would have to do these things. So I just wanted to confirm that uh, that's GFT's testimony that, that that's okay. Along with the caveat that's in the bill that no employee should be required, harassed, or forced into accepting such a responsibility. All right, yes. thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Kenney, if I may ask, what's the present protocol right now in terms of medication? Where is it kept? Medication is kept in the nurse's office in the locked cabinet. Okay. Now, if this uh, legislation is enacted, how do you foresee or the, the protocol on the medication? Because the testimony is is that seconds count. Okay. Yes. You know, and I have no problem with that. And so, right now, it's kept at the nurse's uh, office. Do you anticipate that since, let's say, a teacher may be that designated person to administer, 
are we now contemplating the possibility of keeping the medications in the classroom or closer to where the students might be? Um, most probably we will have to explore on the individual basis where the student in at, is at. If it's elementary, the classroom will be closer. If it's secondary, the main office might be the best because this person move, move, um, move all day long. Right. And I have, I guess, a concern in that area, you know, just in terms of the safekeeping mm -hmm. of medication. Uh, because, because on the other hand, the testimony is that sometimes the campus is so large, the nurse is way across the campus, right, and by the time she gets the word and comes over, it, again, those moments count. Yes. Uh, and so I guess that's one of the protocols that need to really be understood uh, one for the immediate application Access. in an emergency situation, but then also the uh, possibility that those medications could be tampered with or could be accessed by persons who are not entitled to them, mm -hmm. or they could be stolen for whatever reason, and, and that might be an area of concern that we need to really more fully understand okay. Uh, going down the road. Um, I do appreciate your testimony. It does bring a real live face. I mean, we can, we can hear the stories, third-party stories, but we're hearing it directly from you. And so, uh, and, and again, we've heard parents' testimonies and, and whatnot. Uh, I do appreciate Ms. Carbolito's uh, testimony because, again, as part of the board and representing the professionals, uh, in the industry, there are concerns, and I, and I say that because my parents were both doctors, and so I, I fully appreciate what is being uh, uh, brought to the table by, by Ms. Carbolito. This is one of those issues that definitely has benefit to many, many students. However, again, the practice of medicine and the administration of, of medication uh, is something that needs to definitely be examined and considered. And from a legal point of view, I know, I mean, right now it absolves the, the or the, the, the liability uh, issue, of course, this bill addresses, but addresses it only for the administrator, uh, that, that, that uh, designated administrator. It doesn't necessarily absolve others, and we might have to take a look at that uh, mm -hmm. to see if there's any collateral uh, liability that could be uh, uh, found on others that is not addressed in this bill. I, I, I do have to take a look at that a little closer, uh, but I appreciate everybody's presence here. But the medication, the storage of the medication, where it will be located, I know, of course, medication on, on some of them definitely needs certain conditions in which they need to be stored as well as there's the expiration dates and this yes. and that and this and that going forward. So I think that's one issue that needs to be perhaps resolved, it maybe not in this bill, but through the rules and regulations, mm -hmm. but I will speak with the author on this to see okay. if there is a way to address it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I may, just... Yes. I think, um, Ms. Kenney, is it true that no medications are kept overnight? like the student transports the medication with them and then brings no. them home, or they're stored overnight? No, students are not allowed to carry medication, the regular routine medication that's being administered at school, that's kept in the locked cabinets at school. Okay. Okay, thank you. Unless it's a self admin they have self admitted um, studying orders. I thank apologize, you. I just realized I whole, had a whole other sheet of people wanting to testify, so I guess you're going to have to go back to school now, Evie. <laughs> I hope you didn't miss any exams. Okay. No, they were happy because it was the last day of all their work, and now it's just all the fun stuff. <laughs> okay, great. Michelle Peer, can, oh, no? Robert Alexander? Oh. And Michael Cornwall. Please, you recognize. 
We do. Oh, you go like that? Okay, thank you. Just take a minute. I really appreciate hearing all of these comments. I want to thank you for examining this very important issue, too. Uh, my name is Michael Cornwell. I'm a registered nurse. I, was, I have a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, which I got from the University of Washington. Um, been out here practicing nursing since 1984, both in the Northern Mariana Islands and on Guam. I just wanted to make a couple comments because I've only read this bill through once and I really appreciate hearing the in-depth. My question is that, that you would have to answer, are there enough nurses in every school? That's a question that I have. And I'm glad I had the list. I'm not convinced there are. If I talk too fast, tell me, because my wife tells me all the time that I talk too fast. Number two, I was kind of intrigued by the idea of having a, either an MD or an, an advanced practice registered nurse on call at all times. I didn't know that we had them in the school system. And I think you have to have someone that you can refer to. I'm just looking at the writing, and you know, making a health plan for people is really time consuming. And, and I'm just kind of wondering, and I appreciate the testimony I heard too, and just something to think about. Um, life is risky. And how much of the risk is reasonable to try and address, and how much of it is life is risky? People have medical issues. And it leads directly to my next one about training people. And I was really intrigued that it said when people um, learn BLS, they also learn how to use an EpiPen. I thought that was really good. My, feel, my question to you is, and to all medical professionals, how do you know an emergency exists? If a person passes out, do you know this is an emergency? Should I start injecting insulin or epinephrine into someone? You haven't had the training for it. And that's, a, that's part of the risk issue, too. And as far as training goes, I think you have to consider who's qualified to train. Just because I'm a doctor or I'm a nurse or I'm an advanced nurse practitioner, it does not mean I'm, a, I'm qualified to train anyone to do anything. I may be a really horrible educator. It's something just to keep in mind. I think that's it. I want to say self-medication, in my experience for the last over 40 years in nursing, is the norm. It is the norm that people medicate themselves. I've trained my own children to give me di insulin and things. Insulin is good to give if you're over. It can kill you also. It's important to keep these things in mind when we're thinking about authorizing people to do, give medications that can be fatal. On the other hand, it has really appealing. I think, I think airline stewardesses are trained to use AEDs. We can, we, and all our, our, if you have a, a major illness, your family members are trained to give you treatment. And that's just truth. Um, can I make one personal comment and I'll kind of be done. Could I ask in future renovations of this building that you don't have the senators speaking up above and people down here, it, it is a power arrangement. And I think a, a round table might be better to bring out the truth feelings in people's hearts when they're testifying. And I really want to thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody have any? Yeah. On your concerns, what I, I wanted to also bring up is the, the idea of providing for self-medication is mm -hmm. one thing that's, that's um, an important aspect of this bill. And there's also... There's also public law, federal law, with regard to, there's this Asthmatic School Children's Treatment and Health Management Act, which provides not only for self-medication, but it also provides funding to schools that have, uh, in jurisdictions that have laws like this in place. And our bill is similar to, to that sort of concept, that the, the whole idea of, of providing another tier of emergency, uh, administering of, of emergency medication is what we're attempting here. It's, it's a model type of legislation across many jurisdictions, just, and it's primarily an at-will, uh, totally regulated, very, very succinct and methodical application. And, um, but, but I just wanted to bring in the, the aspect of, of the federal law and how there's actually grant opportunities to avail yourself off to store medication um, and, and the like, store and secure medication in schools that have these sorts of policies. But generally, you know, the, we do understand it's a fine line and that's where it, it's very particular about 
about who may be delegated, who may volunteer to serve in that capacity. And it's also not a, a blanket authority to practice medicine in any way or nursing because it, it's also contemplated that the authority only extends for the school year. So if you were to, if, if the child were to graduate to another grade level, that relationship that they established with a provider the, the school year before goes out. So it's, it's, it's a very real time, um, deliberate type of, of execution. And, and I, that's what I want to point out. We're not giving anybody by any chance uh, the authority to practice medicine where they, they clearly are not educated or trained. But like we have in, in other situations where at home your healthcare provider or your spouse or your sibling may be trained to facilitate um, when you yourself may not administer or in cases where perhaps you're too young to administer on your own. So that, that's the simplistic way of, of, and I just wanted to bring that to light, that it's, there is also a sunset to this. It's just on a school year by school year basis. But thank you, um, Mr. Cornwell, for your testimony. Thank you, guys, too. I did want to say, even though I went to University of Washington, which was the number one nursing school in the United States, when I went there, my wife went to Case Western, and she says Case Western was number one. <laughs> Thank you. No, there was no written testimony. There was just comments. Thank you. We'll consider Bill 224 as having been heard. We'll now move on to Bill 267. Um, I'll have the author introduce the bill and then we'll invite people to testify. Mr. Deuce Mossy, Mr. Chairman, Bill number 267-34, COR, is an act to amend section 4406 and 4406.2 of Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, GCA, relative to enhancing procedural protections within the Civil Service Commission in favor of increasing timeliness, efficiency, and due process for classified employees of the government of Guam. This legislation essentially, under current statute, the time standards for case management currently exist. However, adherence is not mandatory. And so this bill makes the current time standards man mandatory, ensuring efficiency, timeliness in the resolution of cases. It also strengthens the due process for classified employees. In past and current cases, classified employees who have won their cases have been forced to wait until completion of judicial review to be reinstated to their positions, which may last months or even years. This bill requires management to reinstate employees immediately if the employee wins his or her appeal before the commission. Insofar as enforcement, under current law, the commission doesn't have an adequate mechanism to enforce its own decisions. This bill gives the commission the ability to file enforcement actions in court. It also penalizes directors who fail to comply by reducing their salaries by 10%. The other main component of this is that it extends the time for the notice of adverse actions. Under current law, a notice of adverse action must be issued to an employee no later than 60 days from the date management knew of alleged or should have known of alleged misconduct. This bill extends the time period to 90 days to allow a government agency ample time and opportunity to determine the facts, reducing the likelihood that, quote unquote, misbehaving employees will prevail on a procedural excuse me, technicality. The Civil Service Commission was created to ensure due process is afforded to all classified employees with regard to employment actions. And Bill 267-34 strengthens and streamlines commission procedures to better accomplish this mission. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, at this 
time, I'd like to invite up Mr. Del Priori, Senator Klitsky, Ms. Kennedy left, Mr. Calvo, and Mr. Fahren. By tradition, we usually hear the testimony of um, our former colleagues first, unless he wishes to defer to the ch current pe uh, people, but otherwise, Senator Klitsky. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Honorable Speaker Cruz and, <coughs> excuse me. Honorable Speaker Cruz and member of the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication I, Robert Klitsky, come before this morning, come before this august body this morning to testify in favor of Bill 267 and humbly suggest enhancement. And I would add parenthetically that I'm somewhat proud of my humility. However, I will waive any architectural objections that I might have to the hall as I proceed through my testimony. You'll notice uh, some hen scratching in about the middle of the page, something that I thought was important that hadn't occurred to me until I got here. So uh, I've added a number six, hearing officers. One of the concerns that the bill seeks to address is the timeliness of resolution by the Civil Service Commission of matters brought before it. Uh, this has probably been a matter of concern since we've had a Civil Service Commission. And uh, once again, I would humbly suggest that a way to deal with timeliness is hearing officers. If statutory language were included that required the use of hearing officers as opposed to permitting the use of hearing officers, you would see much prompter resolution of matters that go before the Civil Service Commission. Number five, the right to appeal to the Civil Service Commission must not extend beyond the voluntary resignation of an employee. I'm aware of one case where by the time the Civil Service Commission got to a particular matter, it was the 62nd day as the clock had run. The Civil Service Commission, I think probably without authority to do so, ruled against the employee anyhow because the employee had resigned and had, quote, gamed the system in order to, get to run the clock up to 62 days. If uh, if the bill, if the law were changed so that a voluntary resignation uh, foreclosed the ability to, to appeal, again, I think it might tend to somewhat lessen the caseload of the Civil Service Commission. I think the key word there is voluntary, because if the word voluntary is used, it doesn't rule out constructive discharge and the similar legal theories that would go beyond uh, the employee's resignation. Number four, express language must be added to the effect that the adverse actions are, adverse actions are governed by Title IV only and not Article I of the Administrative Adjudication Law in Title V. And I've attached a copy of Guam Police Department versus the Civil Service Commission versus Mark Chotfors for your handy reference. In that case, Judge Paris ruled, I think wrongly, I think, I think it was a bad decision, Judge Paris ruled that reference to the administrative adjudication law with respect to rules and the Civil Service Commission meant that the Civil Service Commission should use the rules in Article I which deal with um, hearings for those who allege the deprivation of a property right. Article two is the rulemaking procedure. As I read the statute, the reference in the Civil Service Commission law was to the rulemaking procedure and not the incorporation of the hearing rules for the administrative adjudication law 
into the Civil Service Commission procedure. I think based on just statutory construction, when you compare the Civil Service Commission's organic law to the administrative adjudication law, it's clear that that hearing procedure in the administrative adjudication law does not apply to the Civil Service Commission. Judge Paris ruled that it did. The administrative adjudication law says that unless the petitioner testifies, he can't be called as a witness at the hearing. You'll recall that the Chotfuris matter came up because the government insisted on calling Mark Chotfuris as its first witness. The Civil Service Commission said you can't do that. You can only call him at the end of your case in chief. Uh, the government rested, left, appealed to the, to the Supreme, uh, Superior Court, Superior Court ruled for Chotfuris. I think there may have been reasons to rule in Chotfuris' behavior, but not the one expressed in this particular opinion. Uh, again, I would add parenthetically, the, a rule that does not allow the exclusion of witnesses and the questioning of the petition of the appellant first is really a sweetheart deal for the appellant because the appellant can sit and listen to all of the testimony and conform his testimony to what he's heard whereas if the if the appellant testifies first and the other witnesses are excluded the truth determining process is enhanced so I think the Chotfuris decision was wrong. I think that the lawyering involved perhaps didn't take advantage of what might have been taken advantage of. And I think Judge Paris decided the case wrong and I, I respectfully request that it be made absolutely clear in statute that the administrative adjudication law hearings procedures do not apply to the Civil Service Commission it's the procedures in Title IV and, and the rules that the Civil Service Commission that has adopted that do apply. Number three, cases penned in various stages of resolution. Uh, today, probably somebody got fired or demoted or suspended, and uh, that matter is just starting right now. Uh, the Chotfuris case more than likely is going to go up on appeal to the Supreme Court, etc. That may be around for a long time. So if you were to look, if you could take a snapshot of every case that has be, been begun and not finished, there, there are a multitude of them. And to say that this bill becomes effective upon adoption means that there's going to be a lot of, there, there will be chaos as far as pending cases are concerned. Uh, the easiest one to understand would be that the director, uh, that the chief of police is going to have his salary docked by 10% because he didn't reinstate Chotfuss when that decision came down. So I would respectfully qu request a staggered set of uh, effective dates in the statute that deals with pending, various degrees of pending cases. Uh, number two, section 4406H is added by the bill is poor public policy. That's the one that would reduce the director's salary by 10% if he didn't reinstate the employee after the Civil Service Commission decision. Uh, I would make a distinction between law enforcement and all other government employees. I think if you were to look at the numbers, most of the appeals before the Civil Service Commission come from law enforcement, corrections and cops, and there are a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, if you work, I, I suspect there are very few appeals that come before the commission from the public library because of the nature of the work the nature of the hours, the nature of the authority that the employees have. But when you stop to think about a police officer, a brand new police officer out on patrol has more authority than the Chief Justice of the, of the United States Supreme Court. Because that police officer can, if he feels like it, grab anybody, slap handcuffs on him, 
fill out a few papers, file the papers at the appropriate place, put that person in jail where he will remain until he goes before a magistrate no later than 48 hours after the arrest. That doesn't happen, but that police officer has great authority. The potential for a police officer to make a wrong call, uh, do something that would bring him into the disciplinary process is much greater than for the rest of the community. I don't need to talk about the Department of Corrections. Uh, anybody who reads the papers knows what I'm talking about there. So, um, if it's necessary to coerce a director in the government of Guam into doing, into following the law, then I suggest rather than reducing his pay by 10%, I would suggest the mechanism employed in the open government law. You may recall that the director of land management uh, found himself in, before the Superior Court for disobeying the open government law. And the court ruled in favor of the petitioner and against the director. The director had to pony up $1,000 out of his own pocket because of his failure to follow the law. I su submit that that is perhaps a... I want to ask Mr. Klitsy, did you also note in the same statute under Section 4403 that same, that same sort of um, penalty is also applied there in 4403E. And that was, that was the, the reason that we simply mirrored it in this, just to give it teeth, so to speak. But Understood. do you also have uh, an opinion about that? And, and that dealt with the failure to provide notices of personnel actions with the commission within 20 days. I, I would say the same thing. Okay, because yeah. that, that was the that was the rationale for just applying what was already uh, reflected and contained in the same statute. Uh, understood. It, it, and I would then ask that uh, my testimony be amended. Uh, um, to make it applicable to that section of uh, 4403 if that's permissible, Mr. Chairman. Uh, number one, timeliness should be measured from service of the notice of proposed adverse action, not the final notice of adverse action. This is what I mean. Article two tells you how you go about how a person can be fired and why a person can be fired. Article 4 picks up after that. Article 2 says you've got to give the employee a notice of the reasons that you're firing him. There is then an opportunity for the employee to appear before the director that fired him or that gave him the notice of proposed adverse action saying you are going to be fired, you're going to be suspended, you're going to be demoted. The employee has his FaceTime with the director, he can submit something in writing, he can even call witnesses if he so desires. The director, after that FaceTime, then issues or does a final notice of adverse action, which must be served on the employee within 60 days from the time that somebody knew or should have known about what happened. So what I'm suggesting here is that the period start from the service of the notice of proposed adverse action on the employee with 60 days or the 90 days runs from there on out, not from the time that the final notice is served. Because the employee has a 10 day period in which he can make, do his face to face before the director. Employees can count and employees want to come in on the five o'clock on the 10th day. So that means that instead of 60 days, it's really 50 days. So consider a situation where the director has a face-to-face -face at five o'clock on the 59th day. He's got to decide on the 60th day. I think that too long is a problem, too short is a problem. Too long is a problem because historically the reason we have a 60-day rule is an employee 
was fired 12 months after her misconduct. This is what prompted the, this whole mechanism. 12 months is way too long for all kinds of reasons. So we have a 60-day rule, but the, the problem with the 60, there are two problems with the 60-day rule. As written, it's when management knew or should have known. Well, there's a case that kicked around several years ago called the Strattard case. Strattard was a police officer. He committed misconduct with a firearm without going into the details. His sergeant found out about it, knew that Strattard, and Strattard admitted it, et cetera, that it was all wrapped up nicely at the sergeant level. By the time the chief found out about it, weeks had gone by, the chief uh, demoted Strattard. Strattard went to the Civil Service Commission and said, Sergeant Jones, knew about that 100 days ago, so this, you can't go forward with this. Strattered won, because the Civil Service Commission decided that the, the, the three striper, the sergeant, was management. Now, the potential for abuse and misconduct there is tremendous, where somebody, may a supervisor, feel, may feel far, more loyal, far much more loyalty to an employee than he does to this process. The, uh, the uh, amendment offered here is much better policy, I think, the, and I've included that in my testimony, except that I would suggest that instead of the word void at the end, the word that be changed to final. And the reason that I think it should say final instead of void is because Final would allow a civil service commission to do fact-finding on not the ordinary, but the extraordinary case that comes before it. I, am, I was counsel in a case where the issue was, did the chief of police conspire with other people in the police department to fix a traffic investigation? This did not come to light until after the, a new chief of police came on board. The new chief of police fired that employee, 60-day rule. Well, the whole, the whole thing really got very, very complicated. And if you'd like, uh, I would prevail upon uh, the executive director of the Civil Service Commission. We can find those records. It's probably a box about yay big. We can bring them before this body and see exactly what I'm talking about. That, the, uh, that if we're dealing with a 60-day rule and there is a conspiracy to hide the, the, the misconduct, which happens very, very often, then the 60-day rule is just one more way to game the system. I think this amendment goes a long way to curing that problem uh, concern, uh, compared to the, uh, to the statute uh, as it's written. I think 90 days is appropriate. Uh, I think it's superior to 60 days. And again, I would talk in terms of law enforcement. In order for a police department to function, it needs several internal affairs investigators. Internal affairs investigators, by their very nature, are not out writing traffic tickets, catching bank robbers, or doing anything else. They're policing the police. The shorter the time frame, the more internal affairs officers you need to properly conduct investigations. Somebody has to pay for it. A longer period of time, fewer internal affairs investigators. The other alternative is this. Don't investigate the case thoroughly and put the director into a position where he has to act promptly and may fire somebody who should be retained or he may retain someone who should be fired because the proper amount of time was not available for investigation. So I would say the, 60, the 90 days is better for everybody, including the employee. And once again, I emphasize 90 days from the date the notice of proposed adverse action is served, as opposed to 90 days from the date the final notice of adverse action is served. One other thing I would say about the way the statute is worded right now with 
the final notice being the having to be done by the 60th day. If my suggestion were adopted, there would be no percentage in people who are subject to discipline playing hide and go seek with the chief or the director. And that, that happens frequently. You know, on the 60th day, the employee is out to lunch on a permanent banquet circuit, living under an assumed name in Argentina or somewhere else where he cannot be found. So uh, I think this is a fine bill directing a lot of attention to an area that needs some attention. And uh, I would respectfully request that it, this bill be passed and I hope that some of my suggestions, well, let's put it this way, I'm sure that some of my suggestions will be properly considered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Calvo. Thanks. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, Senators, members of this August committee. Thank you for allowing us to testify on Bill 267-34. The Civil Service Commission was honored to receive your proposed legislation for Bill 267-34, CORLS, an act to amend subsection 4406 and 4406.2 of Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, Guam Code, annotated relative to enhancing procedural protections within the Civil Service Commission in favor of increasing timelines, efficiency, and due process for classified employees of the government of Guam. The Commission staff has reviewed the proposed changes and respectfully provide testimony on this bill. First and foremost, the intent and amendments of the proposed legislation is good and will further minimize costs to the government of Guam in payback issues, litigation issues, and attorney fees, which will serve the people of Guam in a positive outlook. However, may we suggest for your consideration as follows. Subsection 4406, Adverse Action Procedures and Appeals, Section B, uh, regarding the 90-day rule. The 60-day rule, the status quo was, was workable. We've been working with it. However, amending it to 90 days has its advantages. Normally, management already has, their, their, has the cap capability to use up to 90 days, inclusive of administrative leave, with the current statute and rules. Should they need more time? Unfortunately, most managers are not comfortable with this application or, un or are unwilling to authorize a paid vacation for possible violations of, of policy. To a greater extent, some issues just take time to work its way up the chain, of chain to the appointing authority where decisions of this nature are made. The increase, increasing to 90 days would allow for more thorough vetting of the situation and perhaps for both management and the employee to understand the issues and come to a mutual remedy without taking it to the next step. At times, adverse action appears rush and not fully vetted. This may cause long-term harm to the management-employee relationship. The current law reads, when management knew or should have known the facts or events which form the alleged basis for such an action. Until management has the known facts, they may exercise the rule to, to place the employee on a 30-day administrative leave pending the, an investigation. After the investigation, management then has 60 days. This allows management the opportunity to fully review actions of the incident, but should exercise the rule when they become aware of the incident. Historically, the law enforcement agencies and departments utilize this tool frequently, and maybe it has, it's because they normally have an internal affairs section. However, the rule is applicable to all agencies and departments, but as I mentioned, I believe most, most department uh, manager heads are, are uncomfortable utilizing it. In most cases, a supervisor, administrator, or other management personnel does not expeditiously bring up the issue uh, to, to the attention of the appointing authority in a timely manner. And this was uh, uh, mentioned in, in uh, Senator Clifsey's uh, testimony for any number of reasons. This delay hampers appointing authority's ability to make a determination of what course of action to take 
and possibly violate the current 60-day rule. Perhaps legislation should include language to say a management personnel who fails to bring forth an incident requiring discipline to the appointing authority in a timely manner may be issued a reprimand or given a more severe action for, fail for such failure. Two, 40, subsection 4406, adverse action procedures and appeals, section C, suspension and reinstatement pending appeal. This section of the code, along with the personnel rules and regulations, is rarely ever used. It is intended to remove an employee for security reasons pending and the outcome of their final adverse action. However, the same could be accomplished utilizing administrative leave pending investigation rule. The rule exp expands the current language of the law as a separate adverse action, which is why most agencies and departments do not use the, this cumbersome section of the law and rule. This will require management to appear before the Civil Service Commission twice to prove their case in chief. Further, it, is, it has been over 15 years since this section of the rule was used. Perhaps the language of the law should be amended to read, while an employee appeal is pending before the Civil Service Commission, the employee may, may be suspended up to 30 days for security reasons by the department instrumentality or agency. Should the employee prevail in their appeal before the commission, the suspension during the entire period shall be revoked and the employee shall be awarded back pay with full benefits for the duration of, that, of the suspension. Three, 4406, adverse action procedures and appeals section, adverse action hearing, judicial review. The commission has, has failed to meet the time standards provided under this section. Uh, please consider removing the language, this language from the proposed legislation. The Commission has no intention of, uh, to fail the required time standards. In fact, since Public Law 3355, the Commission and its staff has been accused of excessively trying to meet these goals by the parties. Um, additionally, our standard uh, operating procedures have been modified to ensure optimum compliance with the time standards requirement. And, and there are many, many um, things that, that um, are required before the actual hearing and, and um, going through status calls and everything, we, we see a lot of problems um, that parties have in, in getting um, the information to us in a timely manner. However, there should be um, uh, multiple reasons for not meeting the required time standards, which is beyond the Commission's control. Examples include no quorum. Uh, at present, we only have five uh, members uh, when one is missing, it's, it's hard. Uh, uh, we only have four in order to, to make a decision stand um, and uh, getting uh, concessions for concession from, uh, concess, uh, consent from all of them is, uh, is basically a difficult uh, 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 deliberation. Uh, open government media announcement requirement, possible settlement, power or water outages, uh, improper, um, operative uh, recording machine. We've got a new machine, both video and, and um, audio. However, we do still have a little quirk that uh, we're trying to work out with uh, how to operate it uh, efficiently. Similar factual, uh, plus we also have um, power glitches that have uh, plagued, uh, plagued us in that regard as well. Uh, similar factual uh, cases pending in the Guam courts on appeal, management employee or their representative or their representative gets ill last minute. Uh, we've had many uh, instances of that nature. Uh, the administrative law judges are conflicted out, etc. Uh, for 4406 adverse action procedures and appeals, uh, section C, adverse action hearing, judicial review. Uh, the commission has been challenged several times on what exactly this section means. Please consider um, rewording section to, for clarity to read as follows. The party who petitions for judicial review is responsible for providing the commission staff transcripts of the hearings for certification within a reasonable time frame. It will be the party's responsibility to format and file the transcripts in court along with any other certifications of records received from the commission and shall bear the associated costs. Uh, we've had many instances of um, of parties requesting uh, transcripts that, that go beyond our, our uh, resource means, really. Uh, 
subsection 4406, adverse action procedures and appeals. Um, section G, reinstatement pending judicial review. Um, may be recommended to include the word written decision. Historically, the commission makes a verbal decision after deliberation with an affirmative vote of four. The prevailing party has then, is then given 10 days to submit a proposed decision and shortly after the commission sets, a, sets the matter for signing in compliance with the open government. Normally no action is done by the parties until such signing has taken place. Um, I just wanted to point out, I, I, while I am not really comfortable with both G and H of the bill, I, I do understand the the um, uh, and sympathize with the uh, with the uh, employees with, if, or or the parties that uh, in in that uh, judicial review does take very long at times and and it could destroy uh, livelihoods and so it, it's um, it, it does make sense to to try and make uh, some kind of um, take some kind of action in order to reduce that although the question is. Uh, Committed to meeting the time standards, the staff recommends flexibility for the commissioners because of potential unforeseen reasons. Uh, as mentioned in uh, three above, please amend the current language of the law, removing mutual consent of the parties to read as follows. Time standards described in subsections A, B, and C may be waived by the commission upon finding substantial and compelling reasons to determine that a waiver of the time standards is the only option available. And we try and work with all the parties, uh, but sometimes uh, mutual consent is, is not something that that, um, that comes readily, and, and uh, the commissioners, I believe, are, are capable of, of determining what uh, well, uh, what is substantial enough to to compel um, uh, rescheduling. Uh, the Civil Service Commission staff is willing to meet with your office to offer ideas on improving services to classified employees of the government of Guam. Should you have any questions regarding this matter, please feel free to call me at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Del Piari. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker and Senators. Um, Dan Del Priori on behalf of the Guam Federation of Teachers. And I marked that um, the GFT both supports and opposes um, in regard to the proposed bill. Um, at the outset, uh, let me say GFT strongly opposes removing the 60-day rule and changing it to a 90-day rule. Public policy has long, been long-standing in Guam for a speedy resolution of a possible adverse action hanging over the head of an employee. I note, as I've been thinking about this, that the Judicial Council of the Judiciary, I don't know if the Speaker was on the Supreme Court or the Chief Justice at the time, but the Judicial Council adopted the 60-day rule and specifically referred to the Stoddard decision that Senator Klitschke spoke of that came out of the Civil Service Commission. In the 60-day rule, what you are looking at is you know the ending period, the final notice of adverse action. What you're looking at is when management should have begun to take some kind of action. The 60-day rule speaks in terms of when management knew or should have known, but the case decisions of the Civil Service Commission, which are bound in the law library, um, among them the Stoddard, clearly go forward to give the factual situation of what is management. Civil service has already said it's not the, the director, it's not the general manager, but it's the supervisor who has supervisory authority and the ability to initiate inquiry or an investigation. So the body of the 60-day rule is the fact-finding which, um, as Mr. Calvo said, has been amply carried out by the Commission, a fact-finding of when the 60-day rule should begin to consider to commence. And that has been spoken of, as I've said, over the years in case decisions from the Civil Service Commission. It's an axiom of the law that, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. 
Think of the, and the district, the federal courts have talked about letting a possible charge hang over um, a person's head for a prolonged period of time, waiting for that proverbial other shoe to drop. Here, an employee may think or be aware that there may be some allegation against him or her. But what will ever become of it and how long will it take while it's hanging over their head? The proposed notice of adverse action, even the final notice, are forms. You just check off what they're alleged to have done wrong and you fill out the form. It's all ready. These agencies and departments have their human resources divisions, the larger ones may have investigative divisions like DOC or GPD. And I can tell you from the almost four years of working with employees that, for example, DOE, the superintendent Fernandez, I've met with him 11 or 12 times on proposed adverse actions. He only went forward with one, never a question of a 60-day rule. He had everything in order and the employee met with him, he listened to what was said, they asked questions, and it was resolved. Only in some cases where management has neglected to act or move forward um, for whatever its own internal reason has there been this delay. But even that is brought by a motion before the Civil Service Commission, and then the employee and the representative state why, and Management comes back and says, why not? But the fact that the judicial council of the judiciary, a third branch of government, copied and adopted the civil service standards and case decision to illustrate what management is, clearly shows that this is not something that is not workable or out of the ordinary. Management the department agency head and has not only the director but the deputies and the other officials can expeditiously move things along. Again, public policy favors a prompt resolution both in the interest of the people and the employee of an allegation of wrongdoing. And the 10-day period is the opportunity the employee doesn't have to have but to meet with management and say why. The proposed adverse action doesn't say what management is going to do, suspend, demote, or otherwise. It says, this is an allegation against you. You have 10 days, if you wish, to come in and give me your explanation. And then the director, department head, will, will testify. Um, we asked the um, section removing the 60-day rule, which has been long-standing and found favorable public policy, and as the commission's director has said, has been handled by, by the commission admirably. Some motions are granted and, and some are denied. I just had one denied from the, the Port Authority of Guam. The commission is the fact finder wherever such a situation arises, whether management did know and did sit on it or inexcusably did not act promptly. So the GFT urges that that section um, not be changed. In regard to the section on the um, hearings and the time standards, um, on page three, management may not fill the employee's position. Um, the GFT agrees with that. In the section E on page three, adverse action hearing. So set an adverse action hearing. The language in the proposed bill as expeditiously as possible. That language um, has been alluded to the public law, what, 3315, has not worked um, completely as far as the employees um, are concerned. I had a case, uh, Joe Afaji, and that case was not resolved until eight or nine months um, after the appeal. The appeal was filed in, at the end of May 2017. It wasn't resolved until the beginning of 2018. 
in part, there was um, problems with an administrative law judge, but it dragged on on those many months. So the GFT's position is that you make these time standards mandatory. GFT appreciates that Senator Torres and her office and staff have met with GFT representatives and, and sought their input, but the position of GFT is that these timelines, in order to make them workable, and they need to be mandatory. One of the solutions that has been discussed is the use of administrative law judge, and Senator Torres put in the position and funded it for one. And I can tell you from my experience, it has worked very well. An administrative law judge can resolve a case generally in one day that may take three or four nights for the commission as a whole to hear things. An administrative law judge has the freedom and being a, an attorney, the experience to urge people to sit down and talk and resolve things. Um, experience and possibly the confidence that CSC lay staff do not have to say, look, there's room to resolve this, do it. I suggest. So the ALJ um, program should be expanded. Um, perhaps Guam is too small, but I've alluded that in, I believe, the state, uh, well, in the states, states have panels of ALJs that can be drawn rather just, than just one. I believe, for example, that Afaji case, it turned out the ALJ had represented um, in his private practice one of the parties. You know, that didn't come up until a number of months after we were along the way, but he had to recuse himself. So expanding that program, we suggest, is the way to do it. The commission is still involved in a, in a case we just had with the ALJ, resolved within a day or day and a half, which would have taken four or five days. The commission still reviewed what the ALJ came up with in his decision recommendation. And we've also just finished asking a motion for reconsideration of the Commission's review of the ALJ's position. So there still is the Commission's action uh, in there, but that we suggest is the solution, we being GFT, the solution to the time standards. But please consider that when you have an adverse action, the serious kind, like a termination, you have taken a man or a woman out of their job and their ability to support their family, pay their bills, loot, they can lose their car, their houses, they draw out their retirement. It is emotionally stressful for the entire family, not just the employee. Um, a comparable situation is what the courts have done where things have been delayed or some impropriety was done by by the law enforcement, and to prevent that, the courts have ended up dismissing the case of the government. So here too, if the processing by the commission is not done as mandated by the timelines, then the final hearing should be resolved in favor of the employee who is appealing. Particularly in the termination cases, because again, the great hardship. Once the commission has begun to receive the appeal, four months to begin a hearing is not unreasonable. If it's a, maybe the bill should be amended to say termination cases will go to an ALJ. That may, because those are the ones that are most seriously adversely affecting a GovGuam employee and his or her family. And then there should be a tighter timeline by when the hearings are concluded and when the commission meets to issue its final decision. In that same vein, when the prevailing party has 10 days to submit the proposed judgment or decision, GFT recommends that you put in there Three, at least 
three days prior to the end of that 10-day period, the prevailing party will provide to the opposing representative the proposed decision or judgment. That's typically done in the court proceedings because sometimes otherwise a prevailing party could put into a proposed judgment or decision something that the other party would normally object to. It's a matter of, of propriety and courtesy. It had been mentioned in previous testimony that perhaps there should be an exception to the law enforcement or the police. Um, it, the least the last four years or so that GFT has been, that I have been involved representing people, I have only seen the police department there for the post audit for alleged improprieties with promotions and now the case of Mark Chaffros. The vast majority of cases have previously been coming out of the Port Authority of Guam and then generally out of other different agencies. Law enforcement, except with the more recent ones out of DOC, by and large have not brought that many uh, cases to the CSC that I'm aware of. Mr. Calvo can speak differently if he has seen them. Those men and women of GovGuam employees and law enforcement should not be treated any differently. Those are the key issues that the GFT believes um, should be considered. The immediate reinstatement of a prevailing party who has been terminated upon the favorable decision of the CSC, that is a plus. That is a good measure that should be implemented. It will not adversely affect management or its operations. The case has been fully heard as has been uniformly stated here, it can take years to process through the judicial proceedings. Again, you need to look at the human side of this. A man or woman, GovGuam employee, who has been terminated, if they have to wait for the judicial process, then that family will suffer even more, and wrongfully so if the commission has decided that the termination was inappropriate. It will not be the employee who prevailed on having the termination voided that appeals. It'll be management. And unfortunately, from time to time, there are managers who are spiteful, have personal vendettas, have grudges, and they can drag a court through the appellate process. It doesn't cost them any money. Um, and the employee is still out. That part of the bill is, is excellent and will remedy the situation that could exist. Um, you know, similarly too, like we said, the management could have some kind of particular reason to hold an extra 30 days over the employee if you void this, change the 60-day rule. So we believe that too is a factor that should be considered. Um, Otherwise, we favor the, the uh, proposals to have the expeditious resolution of the matters. Um, again, from ex actual experience, while you urge the commission to do this or you know, try and meet these deadlines, the alternative um, is to make the ALG system work and let management at CSC channel the termination cases in particular in the right direction and make the timelines mandatory. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to note one thing, uh, Mr. Del Priori. You mentioned the, you're in favor of, on page three, the 20-day rule, under the section 20-day rule. That would be D, page three, the top. Uh, what, what I was doing in this section, I was, I was essentially breaking up what was one convoluted paragraph into a paragraph that had subheaders so that the different parts of that were clearly identified for reference sake. But in doing so, I, um, I, I inadvertently um, misstated what my intention. And I'm going to refer you to page seven, uh, line seven of page 
three, just so you're clear what, what I, I intend to um, amend in this bill. It presently reads, the statute presently reads that management may not fill the employee's position until, colon, the appeal time frames or appeal, if taken, has been exhausted. And what, what we clar tried to clarify that to mean uh, management may not fill the employee's position until one, the 20 day period has lapsed and no appeal has been filed, or what I meant to do was just reiterate what is currently in statute, or two, an appeal, if taken, has been exhausted and clarifying here upon judicial review. So what, what I intended what I intended to do here, which is not reflected here, is management may not fill the position until two things happen. One is the employee either doesn't appeal it after the 20 day period that they've been issued the final adverse action, or the, the case has, has exhausted the judicial review process. So in other words, it still gives the employee the opportunity to appeal uh, to the for judicial, judicial review if they've not been successful at the um, at the CSC level. So it, it, it's not changing what is already written in statute. And the way that I have it here, it does change it. I, I inadvertently put in commission when really what I meant was judicial review. So I just want to note that for the record because you were in support of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, but, but that will change. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could make an in limine uh, amendment to my testimony. Please. I think it would be a good idea to, to change the law so that if the commission does not resolve a matter within four months, that, it is, that the matter would be dismissed in favor of the employee, provided that the ALJ or hearing officer mechanism is used. Four months is long enough. But not, not four months is not, is, you know, it's not long enough if we're going to continue to do it the way we've been doing it. Get the, uh, set up a panel of ALJs and resolve them within four months. That's, that's better for everybody. Excellent idea. Thank you. I, I think the Senate, yeah, please. Just one, um, so Senator Klitschke had t testified that we should refer in 4406, uh, to Article 2. Yes. Do you agree with that, Mr. Del Priori? He doesn't. It says Article 2 up above. Yes, yeah. Yes, so if you, it if you, be if you to look at the statute, yeah. uh, um, See, 4GC, I can't remember the numbers, but uh, Article 2 deals with employment. Article 4 deals with the Civil Service Commission. And I believe it's the first section of Article 2 that says that if, when you, you it, it tells what termination means, and it says that you must give the employee the, a statement of what he has done and that you propose to fire him. And I'm saying that that's when the, ti that's when the time period, whatever you decide, that's when the time period should run, not when the final notice of adverse action is delivered f f because of the complications that I mentioned. All right, so then what about your paragraph B? My paragraph B. You said to also then insert this language. Yes. And? Uh, yes, to add that to. Uh, so this is from the final charges? This is for 4406. Right, for 90 days. So, but the language now you, that, so we're going to refer to Article 2. Um. We're amending 4406, and unfortunately, it's not possible to copy and paste uh, from, the, from the bill. So I, I had to use the snippet feature, and that's why it kind of looks strange. But what I'm suggesting is that Article 4, 4406 be amended as I've shown, right. but that the, the last word. that 
uh, Senator Tory's provision for the 90-day rule be added into 4406, except that the word void be changed to final. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, speaker, if I may, I just wanted to comment a little bit on the um, on the uh, time time standards. Uh, we have been meeting the time standards. The case that uh, Mr. Del Perry uh, pointed out did have some complications, uh, beginning with the ALJ and uh, recusing himself at a, a later time upon finding out uh, conflicts. Uh, and there were other issues as well that, that, um, that transpired. Uh, and for the most part, the time standards have worked. We've, we've managed to, to meet the, the uh, time standards allotted for each case. Uh, we do have our difficulties at times. Of course, one of the issues that, that we've been dealing with uh, most recently has been uh, the number of our, our um, uh, uh, commissioners is uh, five, and when they start taking uh, leave or anything like that, and we're going to have another situation here uh, shortly in June and July as uh, they take off on, on some leave, uh, well, personal activities, uh, responsibilities that they have to take care of. Um, we'll be out of uh, two um, commissioners uh, for hopefully not an overlapping time, and so it's, it's kind of like that's one of the issues that we're probably going to be dealing with shortly. Uh, but otherwise, the, for the most part, again, all the time standard, uh, I mean, all the cases have been meeting time standards as, uh, as uh, permitted by the public law 3355. Thank you. We'll deem the bill heard. And at this point, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>